Hello, my name's Peter Whitehead and this is one of a series of presentations that I produced originally for the Bromley U3A Art Appreciation Group when we were unable to meet face to face during lockdown. The Art Appreciation Group, uh, as the title suggests, is a group of people who meet who are interested in art but we're not necessarily uh, experts. So this talk is on Paul Durand Ruel. Now you may have not come across the name before um, and that's because he's not an artist, he's an art dealer, um, but a very important art dealer. Some people consider him the most important art dealer of the 19th century, um, both because of the artists he was associated with and partly because he changed the way in which the art market operated. It's estimated that 12,000 paintings passed through his hands uh, and at the time he was dealing there were no impressionist paintings in the National French collection. If you wanted to see impressionism you had to go to his gallery or to his home and it's estimated that a quarter of the collection in the Musée d'Orsay today actually passed through his hands. He merged his business interests as a dealer uh, with his personal interests as a collector. Uh, and so every artwork in this presentation was owned by Jean Ruel or his gallery at some stage. Towards the end of his career, it's the painting that his friend Renoir uh, did uh, of uh, Paul. Um, the sheer scale of the number of paintings which pass through his hands is quite amazing. Uh, 1,500 Renoirs, 1,000 Monets, 800 Pissarros, 400 Degas, 400 Sisley, 400 Cassatt, 200 Manets. These were all uh, paintings that he dealt with. Now, they're not all masterpieces, of course, um, but as we will see, a lot were. Joan Ruel was also instrumental in ensuring that contemporary art in the late 19th century fought its way past the old system of public funded art towards a more commercial and entrepreneurial system. So some details, some biographical and uh, details about Duan Royal, born in 1831. Uh, his parents ran a stationer's and art supply shop. Um, occasionally dealing in paintings as artists paid for their supplies with their own paintings. After an initial spell in the army, he left to work in the family business, setting up his own gallery in 1857 and gradually establishing a chain of galleries around the world and making links with a number of art dealer associates and museums. Initially, he was very interested in what are known as the School of 1830, um, a school of essentially romantic and landscape painters. Uh, and his interest really starts when he is exposed to works by Delacroix, um, the most modern of the French romantic artists, uh, in the 1855 Universal Exhibition. Uh, later, he is best known for his championing of the Impressionists, whom he first met when based in London in the immediate aftermath of the Franco-Prussian War in 1870. And uh, this year celebrates uh, the centenary of his death in uh, 2022. So what was the system within which Duan Ruel was operating initially? Well it's 
the salon or academy uh, system. To gain access to a major exhibition, such as the Salon or the Royal Academy Annual Exhibition in this country, uh, you had to pass through a jury system, which was biased towards academic art, which was the art valued by the art establishment, and therefore was rather conservative with a small c. Um, didn't embrace change uh, really and the aesthetic value uh, of art was determined by its compliance with the traditions of the academic system and the exhibitions were basically the shop window this was how you sold works of art to the public through um, display at the salon or the uh, Royal Academy uh, exhibition and that tradition still exists today uh, with the Royal Academy summer exhibition you still have to pass through a jury and the works there are for sale and as with the summer exhibition the exhibition into which your work would be placed would include work by many artists in many forms uh, in many styles and we have this hierarchy of genres of painting which had been established under the academic system and the top of the pile um, the highest that uh, an artist could aim for was the history painting the large-scale painting on a uh, historical mythological or biblical subject um, the next one down from that was portrait painting genre painting is painting of everyday uh, life and then as you get towards the bottom landscape painting animal painting and still life and if you were working in one of the lower genres in the hierarchy you might struggle to get ex accepted by the establishment and it is artists who were uh, suffering under that system that uh, John Ruel focused on though not, it has to be said, to the exclusion of academic art. John Ruel did deal in the more established uh, genres of art. Um, this painting by David, the famous one, The Death of Marat, um, John Ruel bought it in the 1870s uh, and he used it as a way of drawing visitors into his exhibitions. So this was a famous painting. People would want to see it. Where did you go to see it? Well, it was owned at the time by Joan Ruel. So you would have to go to his galleries or to an exhibition that he was mounting and you would be able to see it. Once you're through the door, then Joan Ruel uh, is able to expose you to other works of art that's, uh, that are less well known. But this is the big ticket item. So what uh, innovations did uh, Joan Ruel introduce? Well, they're covered in this slide here and they might seem surprising to us because we accept a lot of these things as the way in which the art uh, market operates today. But they were actually um, a all elements that Joan Ruel embraced and introduced. So at his galleries or at his exhibitions, you could see exhibitions devoted to only one artist or to a school of artists. Um, what we would call these days, I suppose, one man show, uh, unlike the Salon or the Royal Academy tradition. Uh, he was actively sought to interact with the public to get them interested in art through lectures, newspaper articles, and he published a journal uh, about contemporary art. He supported artists by, in effect, paying them a salary. Uh, he would pay them a certain amount a month, um, but in return, he expected uh, to be offered exclusive deals over their works, so this um, monopoly. Uh, over their work. Now, 
not all the artists were happy with this um, because they recognised that it uh, undermined competition. There's plus and minuses uh, with this. It gave them security in the sense that they had uh, a monthly payment, but they then lost some of the ability to um, sell their own work directly um, to consumers. Uh, Juan Ruel opened galleries abroad, as we'll see. Uh, he worked closely with art dealers abroad and with cultural uh, institutions abroad. He was not um, purely interested in the French market. He was keen for art to be seen, so he opened his gallery to the viewing public. And he also allowed people uh, to come to his Paris apartment to see the uh, artwork that he owned. Uh, he also loaned artwork to people in society. The phrase we would use today, I would guess, would be influencers, so that the work was seen when people went to um, a salon or a dinner at these uh, high society events. They would see the works of art that um, Joan Royal had at his disposal. Um, and he would do deals with these influencers. We say if the work sold, then he would give them 50% of the, of the proceedings. Um, the type of person that he would use, actually the probably the principal one that he used was an opera singer called Four, um, who was a collector in his own right, but also worked very closely with Joanne de Royal um, to put works that he had for sale on display. He worked um, quite closely uh, with the emerging financial institutions in Paris to raise capital using artworks as collateral. And you really start to see in that the genesis of the sponsorship arrangements for exhibitions that we see today. It's quite usual actually so if you look at the sponsors of exhibitions at the Tate or National, National Gallery to see that a bank is involved. And Joan Ruel is the first one who starts um, working within the commercial world um, to gain this kind of sponsorship. Um, but he was also not uh, beyond manipulating the market in some ways. He recognised uh, that the price set for auction uh, at auction for artworks would influence future prices. So if you sell a work of art at auction in this country, Sotheby's or Christie's, the amount that someone pays for it is public knowledge. You may not know who has, has bought it. So um, what Duan Drell was not averse to doing, he'd put works of art in auction uh, and he would in effect buy them back uh, at an inflated price. He'd sell them through auction to himself but what that was doing was establishing a rate for a particular artist at auction and he might have another couple of hundred of works of art by that uh, artist and they were now his his stock was now worth more, so it was worth investing um, uh, to increase the value of his stock. And in effect, he created a market for art based on customer demand rather than critical reaction. So this is uh, Joan Ruel in his gallery, photograph taken in about 1910, towards the end of his uh, career as a dealer. And you can see the type of artwork uh, that he was dealing in. Um, not necessarily all impressionist. That looks like a coro in, in the background there. And as well as going to his gallery to see works of art, you could go to his home. This was his apartment uh, in Paris, the Grand Salon in that apartment. And on the far left, you can see a work by here yeah, you can see a work by uh, Renoir which we'll see later on which 
Juan Royal owned and had on display in his home. There's a few other recognisable styles there. I'm pretty sure I can see a Dagar um, near the fireplace. And if you went for dinner at uh, Juan Royal's apartment, you would find this painting hung uh, in the dining room, Renoir's luncheon of the boating party. Um, Duand Royal did not necessarily sell every work of art that he bought. This one he kept for himself. It was still in his uh, collection when he died uh, and was sold after his death for $125,000 to the collector Phillips. So Joan Royal's first initiative in the late 1860s was to support what was known as La Belle Colle of 1830. Uh, this is a group of artists closely linked to the Barbizon school. Um, he, as I said, he'd been very interested and impressed when he'd seen works by Delacroix at the 1855 Universal Exhibition. And he went on a spending spree after that, buying over 100 uh, works by Delacroix uh, in uh, the 10 years after Delacroix's death. Um, but Delacroix and Courbet, in a sense, did not need uh, Duan Royal's uh, support. They were recognised artists who were quite capable of managing their own uh, output. Um, but the painters listed in the top bullet point there, Corot, Theodore Rousseau, Millet, who were predominantly landscape painters, they were the ones who weren't able to get the access um, through the salon system. Uh, and so those were the painters uh, that Duan Royal supported. He bought their works, he offered to bankroll them and he exhibited their work. So he, as you can see there, he buys 225 coros in a fairly short period, seven years. In one year, he buys 91 works by Theodore Rousseau. And when one of his first monopolistic deals, he offers uh, Millet uh, 30,000 francs a year for his entire output. Uh, Millet turned that down. Um, but when four years later, the Franco-Prussian War came along, uh, Duan Ruel paid Millet um, a monthly salary and he, he, this was one of the artists that he was willing to pay record prices at auction uh, in order uh, to push uh, the value of the paintings up. After the Franco-Prussian War in 1874, there's a bit of a financial crisis in France. It's recovering from the war. The uh, financial sector is struggling and one of the downsides of Duan Ruel linking himself to the banking system is that when that has a problem, he has uh, financial problems as well. So he doesn't buy so much from uh, 1874 and he's starting to get interested in the Impressionists at this time. But he did mount a retrospective um, exhibition in 1878 of the school of 1830, which included 382 works. And the size of Duan Duell's exhibitions is quite surprising. If we go to an exhibition um, at the National Gallery, you might be quite pleased if you see 50 works. Um, uh, Duan Duell was dealing in a bigger scale. So let's look at some of the works that uh, Duan Royal bought and exhibited uh, from this particular school. He did buy Delacroix. This was one that he bought for 96,000 francs. Uh, it was exhibited in Vienna and London in 1873, in Paris in 1878, and New York in 1887. So he had it in his stock uh, for a long time. Uh, in fact, it was sold 
in 1879, uh, but it's, it sold 50,000 francs. He, he made a loss on this painting. Um, Delacroix, one of the most influential romantic painters uh, of this period. Uh, Sardanapalus here, he's the chap lying on the bed. The bed is, kind of, you feel as if the whole painting is tilted towards and everything is sliding off the bed. Um, Sardanapalus um, was about to be defeated in battle. He wasn't uh, willing to be captured. He's, he's an Assyrian king, I think. Uh, and so he says, well, if I'm dying, all the rest of you are as well. So his concubines and slaves are being slaughtered. Even his horses are being killed while he sits there and watches and waits for the end. So a romantic painting, but in the history tradition, it's quite big. Um, and one of the paintings used by Durand Duell to say, come and have a look at my exhibitions. You could see this one was a very popular uh, painting, um, still is uh, actually. But the paintings from the School of 1830 that, that you might have seen, um, Jean-Baptiste Camille Corot, whose dates are 1796 to 1875. This was acquired in the 1860s, one of 225 Corots uh, that Duan Ruel bought. And I would say this is a typical Corot a landscape scene with um, trees, castles, uh, very much I think in the kind of Dutch tradition, Dutch landscape tradition. Millet's Jean-Francois Millet 1814 to 1875. The, uh, this was bought at auction in 1872 for 20,000 francs, a uh, world record for Millet. So this was one of the example of John Ruel preparing to invest because he had a lot of other Millets at his disposal. And this is Theodore Rousseau, 1812 to 1867, um, a member of the Barbizon school. This was bought in 1867. Um, it was sold in 1869 for 300 francs. Uh, later on, it was bought in auction by uh, Degas for a thousand francs in 1899, um, who thought from a distance that it was a uh, coro. Um, so he misidentified it, but um, John Royal actually persuaded him to keep it. So this is oil on paper on canvas, a technique which uh, Degas would himself use, kind of thinned oil painted on paper and then that mounted on canvas. Um, I think the French term for it is peinture à l'essence. So those are the type of paintings and the style of paintings that Joan Ruel was uh, supporting. And then the Franco-Prussian War comes along. Uh, any discussion of French culture in the middle 19th century eventually comes up against the Franco-Prussian War of 1870. Joan Duel fled with his stock to London uh, to carry on business there, but he meets artists also uh, in exile. Initially he meets Daubigny, Daubigny, who is linked to the Barbizon school, and through him, he meets for the first time Monet and Pissardo, and this generates his interest in Impressionism. He acquires works from these artists, exhibits them in London, and then continues investing in the group after his return to Paris. Uh, he's not particularly involved in the first Impressionist exhibition in, of 1874, which is this is the exhibition that generates the term Impressionism. Um, as I said, at that time, he is suffering financially uh, as the uh, French economy is recovering uh, from the war. But although he's exhibiting these works, there isn't really a great deal of interest. Um, in London, 
after several attempts to get people interested, he closes his own gallery, uh, which he'd opened uh, in 1870, in 1875. And he's really not able to start investing in Impressionist paintings uh, until the 1880s. That's when financially he's placed to do that. But he does uh, buy some stunning and familiar works in the early 1870s. Uh, this is a painting by Charles Francois Daubigny, 1817 to 1878, and he's an important forerunner and influence on the Impressionists. Um, he's the chap who introduce, introduces Joan Ruel to Monet and Pissarro. And this is a work the, that he painted while he was in exile in London, a familiar scene, St Paul's in the background, um, Blackfriars Bridge there, and Blackfriars uh, Station. There's one element in this painting that actually reminds me of Turner. It's that red funnel um, in the uh, towards the bottom of the painting that really draws your eye. It always reminds me of the story about Turner and the exhibition uh, at the 1832 Royal Academy where he came in on varnishing day uh, um, and in one of his seascapes painted a bright red um, boy in the center of the work um, causing Constable um, to declare he has been here and fired a gun. Well, I think uh, Daubigny is doing the same thing here. Uh, Daubigny actually seems to have been absolutely amazed how foggy uh, London was. Uh, you could hardly see across the river uh, most days and he reflects that uh, in this work. So this is a Monet that uh, Duan Ruel purchased in 1872 for 300 francs. Uh, it was exhibited in the London uh, exhibitions of 1872, <clears throat> later bought by Alexander Cassatt. That's the brother of Mary Cassatt, who will come across later on, uh, the chairman of the Philadelphia uh, Railroad. Um, more of him and various railroad owners later on. And this is a very famous Pizarro. It's the first Pizarro acquired by Durand Royal in London in 1871. He kept it until the early 1920s, uh, although it was exhibited often. Uh, <coughs> it's eventually found its way to the National Gallery, where you can see it today. And it's to us, where we live in Bromley, um, fairly local scene. This is Lowry Park Avenue uh, in Sydenham. And um, that church at the end of the avenue there is very recognisable. Another well-known painting acquired in London by Joan Ruel, exhibited in the 1871 exhibition. Beloved of a host of Christmas cards, I expect. Uh, so Upper Norwood is very close to um, the Crystal Palace uh, in London. And Pizarro was based, this is the area of South London that he was based in, very close to Dulwich College Picture Gallery, which was very popular, a place to visit by the artists um, in exile here. And this extremely famous Monet, painted 1871, bought in 1872, exhibited in London, unsold until 1877. Uh, it was then brought back by Durand Duel into his gallery in 1907. And although we may think of it as one of the fixtures and fittings of the National Gallery today, it actually um, was bequeathed to the National Gallery 
only in 1971 by Lord Astor of Hever, so 100 years after it had been painted. I think you really do have to stretch the imagination to reveal how, uh, to remember how reviled the Impressionists were, how their work was absolutely despised and laughed at. A rather typical Degas, bought from Degas for two and a half thousand francs. Um, it's always difficult when uh, you're dealing in francs and you're dealing in currency for 150 years ago. Um, <clears throat> but two and a half thousand francs is probably about four times the annual wage of a school teacher in France in the 1870s. So these are quite significant uh, amounts. It was sold to the English collector Louis Hoot uh, for 4,200 francs almost immediately. And it was the first Degas in a British collection, a private collection. Obviously, no national uh, collection was interested in works like this at the time. So those are some of the early uh, works that Duan Ruel purchased. Um, in the 1880s, his financial position improved. He's able to buy many Impressionist artworks, staged a number of group exhibitions and the one man shows that I, and one woman shows indeed, um, that I mentioned earlier. Uh, they tended not to be a success in terms of uh, sales. Um, they were popular, uh, but in a success to scandal, Way. In other words, people came to see what all the fuss was about. Uh, critics came to divide the works. No one actually came to buy anything. Uh, and you can see there the list of works that he bought, who he was invested in. Boudin's an interesting guy. We'll see um, one of his paintings later on. Not normally bracketed with the Impressionists, but he was in some senses the um, acceptable face of Impressionism. Uh, which certainly didn't apply to Monet, Pissarro and the rest. So these are some of the works that Duan Ruel dealt with or exhibited in this period. He acquired this painting in 1872. Uh, it was exhibited in Paris and New York and eventually in London in 1905 at the Grafton Gallery Show. Um, it was bought, not by the National Gallery, it was bought by the collector Hugh Lane, who was intending to establish a municipal gallery of modern art in Dublin. Um, that never happened. Um, I think the political situation in Ireland at the beginning of the 20th century put everyone off. This was bequeathed to the National Gallery in 1970 as part of the Lane collection. Another fairly typical Degas, and this again is Peinture à l'essence, the thinly painted oil paint. Uh, bought in 1872 for a thousand francs, and for the opera singer paid exactly that amount in 1874 um, to buy it. So he, uh, Joan Royal made no profit at all on this, but he then bought it back. 20 years later for 10,000 francs. So in 18, by 1893, the value of the work had increased tenfold. He then sold it on immediately, 1893, to a collector for 30,000 francs for three times what he'd paid for for it at a world record price. So you can see how the market is starting to build up in the late 1890s, but this is all based on investments that uh, Duan Ruel had made in the early 1870s or 1880s. This was bought as part of a group of three pictures from Monet in 1873, uh, sold on 
to a rival dealer in 1883, so 10 years in Duan Morel's stockroom, and to an American collector in 1887. Um, Duan Morel seems not to have been averse to hanging on to paintings for decades until the market became profitable. Um, he tied up capital in artwork, uh, gambling, that it would one day be desirable and therefore um, uh, make a profit. This painting was bought by the collector who also owned Impression, Impression Sunrise. So that's the work that gives the Impressionist movement their name. Uh, he bought that uh, in, uh, in the early 1870s and this in 1876. And it appeared in, Mono's, uh, sorry, in Monet's first solo exhibition at the uh, Duong uh, Royal Gallery in 1883. And these two paintings decorated the Grand Salon in Joan Ruel's apartment. You might have noticed one of them in the black and white painting that I showed earlier, uh, photo, sorry, that I showed earlier. They remained there until uh, Joan Ruel's death, although they were loaned out frequently to exhibitions. Uh, the male figure is the same in each uh, painting. It's the journalist Paul Lote, uh, who was uh, a friend of Renoir's. Uh, in the country, he's dancing, in the countries on the left, he's dancing uh, with uh, a model who would become Renoir's wife. Uh, and in the city, on the right, he's dancing with the well-known model Suzanne Valadon. So we now we turn to America. Now, Joan Ruel was actually, as I've said, making a little headway in France. Uh, he couldn't interest anyone in France in the Impressionist movement, so he turned his attention overseas. And initially, particularly to America, where the industrial boom of the 1880s was fueling a demand for art amongst the industrialists and railroad tycoons who were incredibly wealthy and looking for ways to demonstrate their wealth and modernity. So the critics were still not that impressed, but the artwork started to attract attention and some sales were made. So the first inroads are made at an exhibition in Boston in 1883. 1886 is when he starts making a foothold in the market. He sends over 43 crates uh, of pictures valued at nearly $82,000. The critical response is, as you might expect, this is for a quote from the Brooklyn Eagle newspaper. These people are lunatics. Uh, but 49 paintings are sold at $40,000. So starting to make inroads and the Duand Royal and Sons, his sons actually ran the gallery in New York, Fifth Avenue, New York from 1887. Uh, Duand Royal said <clears throat> at this time, the American public does not laugh, it buys. Uh, and Later on, towards the end of his life, he said, I would have been lost, ruined, after having bought so many Monets and Renoirs. The two exhibitions there, that's in New York, in 1886 saved me. The American public bought moderately, but thanks to that public, Monet and Renoir were enabled to live, and after that, the French public followed suit. Uh, and so it's only really with this exhibition in 1886, having been invested in Impressionism since the 1870s, that he starts to make a profit. So we can look now at some paintings dealt with by the American side uh, of the business. This is America Sat, 
America Sat, as I said, the sister of one of these railroad barons, um, a very influential person, people, uh, the American high society <coughs> consulted her on the works of art to buy and, and as a member of the Impressionist group she was pointing them in the direction of the Monet's and the Renoir's as well as her own work. Um, <coughs> her work was shown in a number of exhibitions in Paris and New York. Um, this particular painting which is now in Chicago bought by them from Joanne Dwell in 1910. Another Degas uh, exhibited in New York in the 1886 exhibition, uh, bought via Duan Druel by Mary Cassatt for her brother's collection, the chairman of the Philadelphia uh, Railroad, uh, acquired by the museum uh, in Philadelphia in 1937. And a Manet here purchased in 1872 for 1,500 uh, francs. In 1872, uh, Duan Royal visited uh, Manet's studio and bought 23 uh, paintings. Uh, Manet wanted 1,500, sorry, 15,000 francs for it, and Duan Royal paid 1,500. That's how kind of desperate the painters were for cash to sell their works. It was sold uh, to the American collector Irwin Davis after the 1886 exhibition. Um, he kept it for three or four years, put it up for auction in 1889 when it didn't sell. Uh, no one wanted it. And at that stage, he just gave it to the Metropolitan Museum of Art for nothing. So this is one of the first Manets to ever appear in a public art collection. The other area that uh, John Duell focused on was Germany. Um, Germany was another very wealthy state uh, at the end of the 19th century. It was a very industrialized state. There was lots of private money and there was lots of um, interest in modern art. And also in Germany, um, the public art collections tended to be funded by gifts from private collectors. So, Joan Duell tries to uh, generate interest. Uh, initially, Quite early on, he's, he's working to establish contacts before the Franco-Prussian War, because then the war comes along and then it makes it quite difficult to deal with Germany. Um, so he has to wait a few years. And it's in 1883 that he mounts the first exhibition of Impressionism in Berlin. Um, and Berlin was interested, Germany was interested when France really wasn't. This is before the American uh, ex exhibitions start sparking uh, interest. And it's one reason actually why, if you go to Berlin today, I was quite surprised when I went to the National Gallery in Berlin to see that they had a quite impressive collection of Impressionist works. We'll see some of them uh, in a minute. It's the late 1890s, before this really takes off, there's an exhibition in Hamburg, um, seen by uh, many people, including the director of the Berlin National Gallery. He starts purchasing in 1896 to create this national collection of French Impressionist uh, works. Um, but eventually, the Kaiser and German nationalists put an end to that. Why should the National Gallery in Berlin be showing these French works? Um, you should focus on German uh, art. So there are still some works to be found uh, in Germany and some very good ones at that. The uh, director of the Berlin National Gallery, uh, a chap called Tudy, um, 
visited Duan Duel's gallery in 1896, saw this work, and this really prompted him uh, to create this collection of recent French painting. He bought it for 22,000 francs. So part of the collection that he established were, were some Monets. Again, this was bought in 1896. The following year, he bought Cezanne, all from Joan Ruel. Uh, this was the first Cezanne in a public collection, but it was funded by private funds. Uh, but by 1900, the Kaiser is getting really upset by this. The National Gallery is right opposite his palace. And if he goes in there, he doesn't want to see French works of art. Uh, and uh, Tsudi, the director of the National Gallery, who's assembling this collection, is sacked in 1907. And that's really the end of the German uh, side of the business. So the last <clears throat> area we're going to look at is his work in London. I've said that he took refuge here in the Franco-Prussian War in the uh, 18 in 1870 and over the next three or four years he was very um, involved in exhibitions of French art not necessarily uh, impressionist art although he did include impressionist works in it there was quite a lot of school of 1830 works shown here this was all the stock that he had brought with him um, to London but he didn't really create a great deal of interest and the gallery closed in 1876. He comes back six or seven years later and mounts Impressionist exhibitions uh, in the early 1880s. Again, they don't really generate any interest. And in 1905, he mounts an exhibition of 315 paintings at the Grafton Galleries in Bond Street. 11,000 people come to see the exhibition, but precisely 13 sales are made. Um, I think this has to be considered as a very serious missed opportunity by British art collectors and the National Gallery. Um, as we'll see, a lot of these works do eventually end up in the National Gallery, but they didn't get there but by being bought at this exhibition. So this is a photograph, slightly blur blurry one I'm afraid when you blow it up to this size, of the exhibition at the Grafton Galleries. A very familiar modern style of exhibition. This could be one of the rooms at the Wallace Collection or indeed the Royal Academy. Um, here on the left you might just be able to make out the Renoir that was in um, Joan Ruel's dining room which he loaned to this exhibition and you try and make out the works of art they look at be a couple of Monets next to it um, a real collection of um, impressionist art in the Grafton Galleries in 1905 yeah, that's the luncheon of the boating party is what you can see um, on the left hand wall. I mentioned Boudin before, uh, Eugene Boudin, 1824, 1898. So he's actually dead by the time of the 1905 exhibition when this work was uh, put on display. Uh, Duan Ruel had bought it for 300 francs in 1889. Uh, the, at the exhibition, it was bought <clears throat> by the Art Collections Fund for £120 uh, and then given to the National Gallery. And this was the furthest that the National Gallery was prepared to go to invest in Impressionism. They were prepared to buy a painting like this and partly they were prepared to buy it because Boudin was safely dead. 
and, and the National Gallery invested in dead artists, not in living uh, artists. So the National Gallery accepted this painting, and that's where you can see it today. We'll come back to the National Gallery. Uh, this is the painting that stimulated uh, Joan Ruel's interest in Manet uh, back uh, in the uh, early uh, 1870s. He sold it to Four, the uh, collector, for one and a half thousand francs. Um, he bought it back in 1886 for five thousand francs and then sold it on to an American collector uh, in 1886 time of the New York exhibition for 15,000 francs. So you can see the, the value that he's generating uh, in this work. Um, loaned for the 1905 exhibition in London. Um, one critic said of it, it is the most cruelly sour lemon ever painted. For the uh, opera singer, also supported Sisley. Sisley was not a successful uh, commercially painter. Uh, this was painted on one of his rare visits to the UK, St Paul's in the distance, the railway bridge at Charing Cross, or also on view. This was purchased uh, by Joan Ruel in 1876, shortly after it was painted. Um, not exhibited though until 1899 so kept uh, for 25 years in stock um, exhibited as in paris in 1899 in the grafton galleries in 1905 um, bought privately eventually uh, and i think it's in private hands now which is why uh, it's recorded as being um, owned by that foundation One of, this is one of the largest and most expensive works in the 1905 uh, exhibition. It's five foot by three foot. Uh, it was sold to a Toronto foundry owner at the 1905 exhibition, so it left this country. It found its way back to the National Gallery uh, via the Courtauld Fund in 1925. So you could say um, Duan Royal is 20 years ahead of his time because all the work of art that was on display in 1905, it, after the First World War, it was wanted. It was not wanted uh, in the Edwardian period. And the final work that we're going to look at is this Monet. It was the first Monet to enter the public collection in Britain, bought by Duane Royal in 1881, uh, exhibited in St. Petersburg, Helsinki, Berlin, Dublin and London in the 1905 exhibition. Uh, from the 315 paintings in that exhibition, it was selected um, as a painting to be gifted to the National Gallery and the National Gallery turned it down. Uh, they didn't want it. They eventually got their hands on it through the Lane bequest in 1970. Hugh Lane, the collector, bought it and it found its way to the National Gallery after his death uh, when all his collection uh, was bequeathed to them. A missed, a missed opportunity. You know, how much would they have had to pay? A couple of hundred pounds they would have had to pay uh, to acquire it in 1905, but it was too modern even then. Joan Ruel retired in 1913 and he did live long enough to see Impressionism become one of the most popular and expensive schools of art. His role in ensuring the development of Impressionism I think is now widely recognised and to be fair the artists themselves recognised it at the time. Um, most of the material for this uh, presentation uh, came from the catalogue of a exhibition at the National Gallery in, in 2015. I didn't actually see, but I got hold of the catalogue, uh, which uh, did much what I've done now, which was to record the influence of Duan Ruel. Uh, and uh, there have been a couple of, of uh, films 
uh, on him. So he's he's recognised now for uh, his importance in uh, ensuring that Impressionism and Impressionist artists were able to paint and indeed to survive. Uh, in 1920, uh, John Morrell said, at last the Impressionist masters triumphed just as the generation of 1830 had. My madness had been wisdom. To think that if I had I passed away at 60, so that's in the early 1890s, uh, I would have died debt ridden and bankrupt, surrounded by a wealth of underrated treasures. And I'll finish with a quote from Monet, who in 1925, three years after Duand Ruel's death, said, we would have died of hunger without Duand Ruel, all we Impressionists. We owe him everything. He persisted, stubborn, risking bankruptcy 20 times in order to back us. The critics dragged us through the mud, but he, he was worse. They wrote, these people are crazy, but a dealer who buys their work is even crazier. So that's the story of Durand Durrell and his impact uh, on modern art. I hope you've enjoyed this talk. Um, I have a number of talks on a YouTube channel called Art for Art's Sake. There's a link on the screen here if you want to follow it. There's probably about a dozen uh, now uh, talks uh, on a wide variety of, of, of art subjects. So I hope you will um, look at some more of these, uh, subscribe to the channel and let me know what you think uh, about the, uh, the talks. Uh, thank you for listening to this one and uh, goodbye.